All right, thank you. I'm gonna move my monitor here. Ooh. All right, let's get this. Okay, that's funny. It's blocking my view. All right. Ooh. All right, sorry, give me one more second, Paul. How about I just get rid of that? There we go. All right. All right. So, yeah, thank you, Paul. And uh, hello, Torkai. Um, and thank you for inviting me, too. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you guys today um, about information architecture beyond uh, navigation labels. Uh, and organization. Uh, I've, I've got uh, two objectives uh, today. Um, and, and one is, is to explain information architecture as an area of study, uh, which is uh, a new sort of framing and positioning that typically um, hasn't really been uh, discussed. Uh, so I'm looking forward to trying to, this is sort of my, my test of introducing this idea. <clears throat> I've actually written about it uh, in one of uh, uh, one of my posts, um, which I, it's an actual live post. I'll talk about it later on. But uh, this is a topic that uh, I've been uh, pretty much working on for, for a number of years. Um, and uh, the second that I'd like to do is to suggest um, how to integrate information architecture thinking into your design process um, or, and to improve outcomes uh, if you're not already, already doing it. Um, I'd also, um, I want to show you what I'm doing in this space as well. So I'll, at the end, I'll kind of kind of bring it home and show you what I'm doing, uh, because information architecture, as you'll see, um, it ha is a very um, widely practiced uh, field, and, and there's a lot of variety to it, and there's a reason uh, for that. So uh, let's get going. Um, a little bit about me, uh, which actually I'm going to skip because Paul just said all that. So yes, I'm an, an independent contractor, and uh, I'm very interested in information architecture theory, the science, and the practice, and how those three are uh, interconnected, because it's very important uh, for continuity in, in this practice. So, uh, and I'm also um, uh, very interested in the software uh, for um, uh, building conceptual, practical conceptual models. So uh, in my spare time, I do dabble into to code in order to try to build tools that actually help me to, to um, do my work better. Um, as it pertains to the origins of information architecture, um, the term information architecture can be credited to Richard Saul Lerman, as many of you may know, in the early 1970s. And his goal was to improve really his approach to reducing complexity in an effort to understand something uh, um, for his clients or to a larger audience of readers. Um, understanding was central to Wormann uh, and how he got to what he um, would say, how he would get to understanding. Um, and it was a journey that was more, it was the journey that was more important than the problem in some cases for Wormann. Uh, Worming was more interested in the conversation and only expanded his audience by, uh, by those who were also interested in his conversations. And as most of you probably know, uh, Worming found the, the TED conference. Um, he never tried to build a new discipline or practice except for his, his own edification. Uh, later in his career, however, you know, he began to recognize how Others were tackling similar challenges, and, but in different ways. And so I think he began to embrace this idea um, that there was a larger interest around what he referred to as making the complex clear. Uh, by the end of the 1990s, Richard Saul Werman never tried to articulate or frame uh, an approach to fostering broader formal practice, but his perspective and approach can still be classified as being part of the genre of information architecture that we'll be expressing, or that I'll be expressing um, today. This brings us to uh, a new use of the term information architecture um, that surfaced in the late 1990s. 
Um, we actually find a more concerted effort around information architecture as a, as a term and as an idea with the writings of Peter Morgan and Rosenfeld, um, who reintroduced the term to the general public. Um, they were not influenced by Worm's work uh, necessarily or per se. Their perspective was mainly driven by library and information science. Um, however, they, they were connected to Worman by relating the work that they did uh, at the level of, uh, uh, of architecture, right? And, and Worman was an architect. Um, the difference here is that Peter Morville and Rosenfeld were trying to, um, uh, to address an issue and a problem that extended way beyond themselves, uh, um, unlike Worman, who was very um, uh, more self-centered, uh, but in a constructive way. I say that as, as not as a critique, but um, uh, Peter and, and Lou were thinking about an issue that was affecting millions of, pe millions of people uh, and businesses um, that were challenged with dealing with scale and complexity uh, with web uh, browsers and web interfaces. And so this is kind of where I want to start in a, the conversation about information architecture. The aspect of scale and complexity that Peter and Lou were tackling um, was affectionately referred to as the pain with uh, no name. Um, back up here. Um, it was something that every organization um, that jumped into this new world of the internet and the web struggled with. Because this was so new, there was no word for it, but the pain was real, right? Um, and this pain surfaced at uh, the user interface. The affordances that were being used uh, were limited. Um, they were absent of uh, an, an absence uh, of uh, affordances um, and they were becoming less intuitive. So in addition to that, we were just moving from single pages to hundreds of pages to thousands of pages, right? So moving through these pages were becoming cumbersome. And as a result, websites were often confusing to people. So you have a growing trend where people were, were not able to achieve their goals and businesses struggle to meet their objectives. Uh, technology teams are struggling to deliver value promised by the web, and this was a problem. In uh, 1998, right, uh, it was this book uh, that helped technology teams uh, to plug a uh, major hole. So in addition to explaining how to solve the problem, this book also demonstrated the principles of uh, um, Morrill and um, uh, Lou Rosenfeld's framework to help solve the problem in a more consistent uh, manner. And they ended up with the popular three circles diagram where information architecture is in the center. Um, and it argued and it um, addressed these pains, right? Um, to improve usability that the teams will have to begin thinking about um, uh, the idea is that they would have to begin thinking about uh, three things, right? In context, users, uh, and, and content. Now, the focus is not on the user interface, right? Um, but on the conditions that lead to the UI. Uh, at the time, this was a different conversation to have. Um, Although it wasn't new to HCI, right, um, in, or other fields like ergonomics and human, human factors, and, and not even new to library and information science. These are uh, foundational and really important principles. Um, and so these are important to have, and they've been used to solve related issues regarding human interaction with objects or within, uh, whether the objects are physical or, or digital. Uh, Morville and Rosenfeld bucketed these concepts and generated these relationships uh, and placed information architecture at the center. Now, most people's initial reaction to this graphic, uh, I would probably um, say is probably maybe a, a false sense of uh, agreement. 
because if you dig deeper, it becomes difficult to express why it in, uh, what it implied um, by information architecture at the center. The industry has not been uh, really effective at discussing what, hap what really happens um, at the center of this Venn diagram. And because of that, uh, the field of IA has been fair game to scrutiny. Uh, in spite of this, however, the scrutiny and, and, um, and not going into details here, um, their book frames information architecture around four key um, areas uh, that were necessary to improving uh, user interfaces. Uh, navigation systems, labeling systems, organization systems, and search systems. I'm sure you're all maybe familiar with that, right? Now it's worth noting that uh, here that they didn't just say navigation, labeling, organization, and search, but they added the emphasis around the idea of systems and, ex and expressing these systems. So the Polar Bear book right, um, was meant to be accessible to a wide audience. And that's, that's what I'm assuming here. And, and I would guess that probably 1% of the readers of this book were non IA uh, or 1% or were IA specialists, right? And another 99% were a very broad general audience. Um, so consequently, then and now, almost two decades later, there's been little, little effort in the field to define what would be considered uh, acceptable systems, right? Systems for navigation and systems for labeling systems for organization or search uh, from the view of, of this practice. <clears throat> um, and uh, also, you could say that they also did not have uh, um, an expression for how you would even engineer and maintain these systems in the face of scale uh, and complexity. Um, so for, for more than two decades, the field has fallen short to express its intrinsic value to the broader field of human computer interaction and has struggled as a victim of its own success. Um, humans have a natural propensity to simplify complex uh, uh, problem spaces by reducing them to smaller digestible parts. And the same was true for information architecture. We ended up with wireframes, site maps, and taxonomies, uh, labeling strategies, and anything else you could fit into a, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, the artifacts became the remit of information architecture, uh, not the value of the process by which the hidden relationships were revealed. Uh, and by which those relationships expressed um, or were expressed to drive um, out outcomes and better outcomes for teams. So um, in the early 2000s, um, information architecture was threatened by the prospect of becoming a commodity uh, and lost its footing, I would say, to the rise of UX design and content strategy. Although content strategy um, was several years, a little more down the road, more like in, in 2010. Uh, so between 2000 and 2003, information architecture was just getting hammered um, um, by, by critics who just were not sold on deeper value of information architecture. So, um, and by 2003, the field was exhausted of intellectual discourse, and debates, and they were going nowhere. Um, this actually, this piece is, um, there's a, a, um, a poster that I have on my site where I do some um, uh, tracking of uh, some of the key uh, frames around um, the schools of thought of information architecture um, in, in some of the earlier years. And so this is a snapshot of, um, showing you this, um, I have to come over here so you can see my mouse, um, uh, essentially a, a massive 
void of activity uh, of papers that just were not being written. Um, let's see. Um, while time was moving on, the community still continued to discuss and hold professional conferences, uh, but the intellectual void persisted until about 2009. Um, uh, the return to debating the value of IA was reignited uh, when the IA Institute um, contest um, was put on to reposition uh, information architecture. Uh, some of you might remember I don't know how many of you uh, remember the dinosaur ad, but this was this this particular. Um, I won't play it now because I'm not, I don't want to run into technical issues. Um, but uh, this entry actually described information architecture, but it also described in this in its description of, of information architecture, it also described the pain of having to describe information architecture, which was pretty funny. Um, oh, here we go. <laughs> Mommy, what do you do for a living? I'm an information architect. It's just like real world architecture, except we build computer interfaces. Do you make the interfaces pretty? No, that's the designers. Do you make the interfaces work? No, that's the developers. This is information architecture. Just like how Frank Lloyd Wright designed famous buildings that everyone loves. Famous information architects have made. And. What do you really do, Lonnie? Let's say an interface is like a house. We design the rooms and hallways so people can easily find what they need. That's it. Well, in 1995, anyway. These days, strangers can go straight into the house through any room they want. That's scary. Let's start over. Another way to describe it is that we organize interfaces and their content. We're like librarians. We tag and sort everything so people can zero in on the things they're looking for. Don't people just use Dig and Facebook and Twitter now? Don't even get me started. How about this? Let's ask the author of the book, Information Architecture. You want another fucking definition of information architecture? I'm so sick of defining the damn thing. All right, I'll give you one. It's a bunch of fucking clumpers clumping and a bunch of and splitters splitting. Is that good enough? That good, uh, I guess. <laughs> but remember what Jesse James said at last year's Information Architecture Summit? The web is like clay, raw material that we shape into experiences for people. Yeah, so uh, I thought that was interesting, but that was that's what, what the, the industry was the, or the field was going through at the time. Uh, uh, a, a lot of soul searching and reflection. Um, so uh, by 2009, uh, in the same year, the IA community doubled down on information architecture uh, with the launch of a peer reviewed journal specifically devoted to information architecture. Um, and uh, that was the Journal of IA. And it paused its publication um, in 2013, but just recently returned. Uh, with uh, new submissions in 2021 uh, this year. Um, this effort was also followed up with the introduction of the IA Roundtable uh, in 2013. And um, two publications that, um, it also was followed up with two publications that was tracking the ideas that were being um, generated in the field. Um, and through the round table, all right. Um, and uh, I probably would say that all three of these efforts, uh, all these three efforts were guided by uh, this guy here, <laughs> uh, Andre Rizmini. So big public thanks to, uh, to Andre for his efforts. Um, and he's still um, plugging away uh, with all of these efforts today with a lot of help from other practitioners in the field. Um, all right. So, so now that we're sort of caught up with, uh, with some context, um, um, let's take a look at some leading definitions. I'd like to do that uh, in some leading definitions of information architecture. Um, this is not a comprehensive list uh, and I'm leaving out a, a lot of people who have contributed to uh, the discussion and debates around information architecture. 
but I am handpicking um, uh, some definitions that have gained some traction as well as a couple of recent definitions that have surfaced um, just this year. Um, what you'll see here is a, is a pattern uh, that's been playing out over, over two decades where most of the definitions focus on, on expressing a practice of information architecture. And I was also guilty uh, of this as well. Um, but in my research, I later came to realize that trying to express a single practice uh, was a red herring. Um, fortunately, uh, we'll get past this uh, to embrace what I think is a, um, uh, a foundational representation or that, something that can stand as a foundational representation for the field um, of information architecture. Uh, all right, so let's take a look at um, a, a popular multi-part definition. Uh, this was you know, originally produced um, or uh, created uh, by Peter Moverell and Lou Rosenfeld. And I assume that uh, Jorge Arango, um had his hands in, in, in this one uh, in refining this particular definition, these definitions, since um, these are updates that uh, were shown in the fourth edition of the Polar Bear book. Uh, the structural definition of shared environments uh, has been fairly consistent um, uh, over the different iterations of the book and, and nothing much is, has changed there. Um, there's still a concept of structure uh, and the idea of shared environments, you know, that naturally gives rise to these complex, uh, complex scenarios. Um, in the second bullet uh, of this multi-part definition, um, they replaced combination with synthesis, uh, looking back at the previous um, uh, edition. And I think, this is, I think this is an improvement because it helps to bring focus to the uh, idea um, uh, of synthesis where common, the, the word combination really just expresses relationships between organization, labeling, right, and search navigation systems. Um, so for me, I think that they, they made a significant improvement here uh, that helps to give way to um, a, dis, a more sophisticated idea. Um, and it's, it's focusing on the actual um, uh, trend, uh, uh, synthesis for these, these uh, different concepts. Um, this list, uh, the last bullet is also fairly consistent with previous versions. This helps um, to express the scope of information architecture beyond the bounds uh, of working, um, beyond, a working, beyond working with more tactical issues, right? That you might come across um, in some of the previous bullets. Uh, and also allows the, um, uh, the, the flexibility to sort of to, to work in different types of spaces that go beyond digital. Um. <clears throat> um, in a 2012 essay, um, this is Jorge Arango. Um, Jorge Arango posited that uh, information architecture is the intentional composition of nodes and links uh, as organized structures that facilitate understanding. Um, and so I'm highlighting some of these really important key concepts uh, that are that play out and that are central and that have really been um, uh, concepts and ideas that we've been seeing over the years. We've just been saying it, we've been saying it differently, but the fact that we constantly repeat it, uh, these ideas um, are expressing pattern that we really should, should take note on. Um, this was somewhat new when Jorge introduced this um, and people um, uh, really liked where this was going when he introduced this uh, around 2012, but he follows up in 2013 um, with what appears to be a refinement of, of, of that original thinking. And this is something that, uh, that, that uh, took on uh, like wildfire in the intellectual community, you know, and a lot of people were really uh, uh, um, gravitating to this idea of structural integrity uh, uh, of meaning across contexts. And 
Now, a couple of years later, and this is uh, circa 2014, 15, um, the Information Architecture Institute described information architecture as a practice um, of deciding how to arrange the parts of something to be understandable. Now, I wasn't really crazy about this when they when they um, this was mentioned because I thought that it it was really going in a different direction. Um, and uh, and from my perspective and my approach, I tend to lean more technical. But um, I under I did understand what they were attempting to do here in in being broad. And this this definition is actually a uh, and also, th this definition here is actually a clear departure from uh, Warman, I'm sorry, from Peter Morville and Lou Rosenfeld's popular spin about information architecture. And, and so it takes on here, this takes on a, a very universal tone that sounds, you know, almost nothing like information architecture, um, in, in my opinion. Um, however, a follow-up um, explanation does provide some additional specificity. I'm not sure if I edit that here. Let's see. Um, yes. Um, this is right. And so this um, was additional context, right, to that, um, to that definition, to the previous definition around arranging the parts and making a whole. And so and they introduced this idea of facilitation uh, and organization. So they're, they're and considering their structures and language. So again, we begin to see, you know, um, I think what surfaces here is this idea of facilitate, facilitation, um, structures playing out again, and they still haven't, for. they're saying, hey, we haven't forgot about these things, structure and language. Um, but I, th I think they, the definition that they provided was um, they were trying to go broader because um, I think and we'll see in the next few slides as well that um, that uh, practitioners uh, and researchers are trying to push beyond digital. Right? Um, so earlier this year, Peter Morville um, wrote an article called Emancipating Information Architecture. Um, and he provokes the field to consider a new definition around information architecture. And so this is like, okay, uh, where are we going here, right? There's a, and, and so two decades later, we're, we, we're still pushing and, and, and prodding. And Peter now comes in and um, with this idea, um, he makes this passionate argument that the field should be at the center of language um, uh, or designing the, uh, or at the center of language and classification systems um, that, it, that influence the world. So this is a, uh, this is a moonshot. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a lot here. Um, and, you know, this is a recent um, writing of Peter. Um, and so I'm sure there's a lot more to come. On, on this idea. Um, but similar to the I Institute from the previous slide, um, this is another shift you know, right, in the messaging from what people might be expecting um, from practitioners possibly uh, in this field. Um, but, but underneath Peter's aspirational vision for the field, there's still a thread that uh, is connecting what Peter Morville um, is trying to do um, for the rest of the field. Um, again, there is there's some uh, there's not too much different in terms of some of the key concepts that we find in the uh, in in these descriptions. Uh, the context uh, seems to be um, changing slightly. Um, the most recent uh, public. Um, positioning of information architecture um, that's worth noting uh, uh, was offered by uh, Jesse James Garrett, um, who states that information architecture is systematized understanding so that insights can be scaled. Um, here we see uh, more mention, mentioning of systems, 
uh, and its relationship to promoting scale. Um, he also goes off to say that IA practitioners are, um, or I think he suggests that they would they could be stewards of understanding um, and uh, who take the association between this the association between ideas that give meaning to human endeavors and makes those concrete. Uh, there's a video out there and I'll also in, include uh, all the, uh, the, the links to uh, everything that I'm citing here so that you guys can um, go deeper if you want to and, and listen to uh, these videos or uh, read some of the articles that, um, that I'm uh, talking about. Uh, lastly, um, I want to point out a survey that was performed by Austin Vela. Um, he surveyed uh, attendees from the 2020 Information Architecture Conference, and the results show a wide range of concepts that people associate with information architecture. Um, the survey shows there's an extensive uh, vocabulary when it comes to detecting or uh, to describing information, uh, describing information architecture uh, as a practice. Um, this, let's see, so, um, okay, so in looking at these, so if you, if you look at these, um, you can begin to see the, the potential challenge here. I mean, with all the definitions uh, and ideas that I've mentioned earlier, um, and even when you have even more individuals who are um, uh, coming together to express their ideas about um, uh, the field and what they think some of the core uh, uh, interests are, uh, it's, it's very broad, right? Um, However, there's one overwhelming trend um, that you'll find when researching this field. Um, and it's that information architecture appears to be something more, uh, or I'll say that there is, there is more to information architecture than navigation labels and organization. Um, I'm going to take a quick pause just to uh, catch up on uh, any um, questions that you may have right now and, and feel free. I'm gonna uh, just take a look to see if uh, there's anything that uh, anyone want me, wants, if anyone wants me to expound on or, um, or address. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Abby Covert is definitely arranging, the arranging of information to serve an intent. Um, yeah, Abby actually assisted with the uh, Information Architecture Institute uh, in their, uh, the Information Architecture Institute's last um, um, refinement of the, uh, of the definition. Yeah, um, so she's definitely had some influence in, in, in the conversation, so definitely appreciate her work. Uh, I, I actually figured that putting um, the Information Architecture Institute's uh, version essentially captures her, uh, her ideas pretty well. Uh, all right, so. Gonna... All right, so. Uh, how do we resolve this? Uh, this is where my research comes in. Now, for a number of years, I, I've been publicly, publicly writing a post on the disambiguation of information architecture um, and, uh, it's, uh, and the, its consequences. Uh, it's really the consequence of some, of some of my research that I've been doing. Um, there are different uses of the word information architecture. Um, you can use the, the term information architecture to describe practice, right? You can say the word and people might, uh, depending on who you're speaking with, uh, wonder if you're talking about the discipline or are you talking about the work product of information architecture? The thing that uh, you, you know, and when people refer to the information architecture, they'll say, well, um, you know, uh, 
I don't like the information architecture of this site as a thing, as some tangible thing, um, or as the navigation uh, scheme, uh, or uh, how the content is organized. All right, so um, the same word can mean many things. Uh, of all the qualifications um, that uh, um, are used uh, to, or I said not qualification, qualifiers, sorry, of all the qualifiers, uh, I've recently come to ponder uh, what I feel is uh, the most important. Um, and that is uh, information architecture as a field of study. Um, so let me fix my screen over here. Uh, so my proposal um, to the industry uh, and to the field is that Information architecture is a field of study um, uh, that is concerned with facilitating shared understanding and alignment with conceptual clarity. I think uh, that sentence needs to be fixed here. Uh, so let's look at some of the, uh, the key concepts of, of this, this definition. Um, and to do so, we'll have to go down a few levels before uh, this starts to beginning, before this starts to make uh, some sense and we can look at some of the dependencies of this. Um, so key uh, to this idea um, are two things, um, shared understanding and shared alignment. Um, the field is very interested, if you look at the history, and you look across um, all the different um, uh, um, essays and, and articles that have been written. And um, one underlying um, idea is that the, that, that the understanding that is, is achieved is one of shared understanding of across, not of across multiple um, participants within a uh, particular domain. And the same is true for alignment. It's how to facilitate shared understanding and how to get to alignment. In order to, um, to do this, understanding has a dependency um, and it has to consider um, consensus. And it also has to drive at synthesis. And this understanding is really about uh, the domain, right? Um, this is the focus uh, when information architecture practitioners are uh, engaging, they're interested in, in two things, or um, uh, they have to pursue consensus and synthesis or, uh, within the domain. And um, as it pertains to consensus, the idea of well, what are we trying to gain consensus around? Um, and trying to gain consensus around the context and the language within a particular environment. Um, the context uh, essentially is the boundaries. Uh, information architecture practitioners are driving at, um, at these, uh, at trying to understand where do you start, where do you stop? So that that provides that context. Um, and uh, and then looking at the, um, uh, the language that is establishing a, uh, also establishing a degree of context and limitations to, to a particular environment. Um, Andrew Hinton actually comes to mind uh, when uh, I say that, I just said that and I thought of Andrew Hinton because uh, Andrew Hinton talks about and has, has spoken in the past about uh, um, how language can become this construct to establish uh, context. Um, so these are these are ideas that are central uh, to uh, to the process. Um, when we're thinking about synthesis, 
uh, what are we synthesizing? We're synthesizing uh, the behaviors that are playing out in this space, right? Uh, and also, and those behaviors are tied to things that people are doing and the way that people are expressing themselves through their emotions and through their feelings, through their um, ideas and perspectives. And these play out. Uh, and so the, the, when a, a group of individuals and people come together to try to understand a domain, it's important that uh, these behavioral um, uh, aspects and properties that are playing out are, are observed and seen, and then everyone comes to, uh, to, to, to ground themselves in the behaviors that, that, uh, that are the focus uh, of, of their, their goals. Uh, and then lastly, in this area of synthesis is the content, is making sure that there's a lot, there's an understanding of what um, uh, artifacts people are actually uh, using in a particular space. Um, when you have that, when you can sit down and, and um, uh, provide this overview and then uh, discussion around all of these, uh, these particular aspects of context, the language that's being spoken, um, that's playing out the meaning of things uh, that are um, that is playing out within that domain and the behaviors, what people are doing, uh, and in the content, the things that people are using, that gives you that um, uh, uh, perspective uh, that everyone can can come to the table and and um, be able to agree upon. That typically leads to. Um, um, an artifact that uh, uh, practitioners use is a model, right? Models, and this goes back to, you can say, the nodes and links, boxes and arrows. Uh, it's a powerful tool uh, for expressing clarity uh, or expressing uh, alignment with clarity. And so, uh, and that's the other portion of it, um, that clarity is fundamental once you get to this bottom level is that an understanding that it's clear. You take in this complex domain and you provide that clarity. And so the tool for expressing clarity in most cases um, is uh, you, it generally ends up at being some type of model similar to what I'm doing right now, right? Um, and let's go to uh, the next. So the, the next is area is shared alignment. <clears throat> now, what I mean by alignment I have to move this out of the way here. Um, what I mean by alignment um, is alignment has to consider a continuity uh, and coherence. And when we think about continuity, uh, continuity is essentially um, uh, the structure of what we think we understand in. Uh, uh, um, and so when we're doing that, we're looking at a number, we're entertaining a, a number of two uh, additional uh, ideas, if I can get my mouse to work, okay. Um, in continuity, we have to consider the interactions and the topology. Interaction simply means the rules for why a, uh, um, something, is behaving and uh, considering that because those considerations will drive the actual interaction, the tangible interaction that a designer will design for, design to. So those rules need to be there. If those rules aren't there, it makes it difficult to uh, know exactly what type of affordance someone needs uh, for if we're talking about interfaces. Um, and um, uh, and those rules have to be uh, considered. And uh, the other is in topology. And topology is the idea of this, uh, the rules around um, the spatial arrangement of either, it can be um, uh, cons uh, words placed next to each other or categories of things placed to each other um, or um, ideas situated uh, near each other, but a way of uh, understanding um, how to express 
the weight of the meaning of things for a designer who has to um, uh, deliver an, uh, um, an aesthetic uh, interaction or, or engagement to a user if we're talking about uh, user interfaces. Um, so, um, and, and here, I wanna make sure that, you know, the idea here, we're doing all this without touch, without doing anything that's visual. Um, this is about giving these inputs to the user, uh, to uh, designers um, and enough insight and understanding uh, and rationale so that they can actually design effectively. Um, the, uh, the next is in terms of alignment, aligning, um, alignment has to consider the coherence of the constraints and intent. Um, and so when we're thinking about constraints, these constraints are, are uh, for the constraints in, uh, around, um, or actually the constraints for everything that we've uh, uncovered uh, from the left of this uh, uh, this model, uh, and sometimes the constraint can be a framework that that um, such as a mental model, for example, um, that scopes out uh, the domain in a in a high level in a very simple way that provides guidance for designers, for product owners, uh, for the businesses, for the entire team, so they understand the the mechanism that is playing out. Uh, in a particular domain that you're trying to design an interface for. And then lastly, uh, driving at coherence uh, of the intent. And the intent essentially is um, uh, a rationalized, what I call rationalized objectives. Um, and it's the core uh, objectives that are um, considering all of the factors. Um, let me see here. So just want to see. Oh, okay. Now, all right. So that was a lot. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I'll talk about Jared Spool. Jared Spool, um, several years ago, um, he uh, he said that design is the rendering of intent, and I have no issue with this definition. Um, and it's gained um, uh, some traction over the years and has provided actually a great segue for discussing the value of information architecture or the lens of it, or what the, uh, the, uh, the lens of information architecture can bring uh, to this statement. So we'll go back. When teams struggle uh, with collective understanding and alignment, it will always be difficult to produce a rational intent for a design effort. Um, without sound intent, design is certain to fail. <clears throat> intent must come before the design because design is the act for generating a solution to a desired intent. Fortunately, based on what we've reviewed, hopefully, um, you can see how the study of information architecture can squarely address um, this idea of intent. And when we look at what interests, what are the, the core interests of information architecture as an area of study, um, we see that intent is part of that story. It's an important area of interest. We know where it is and uh, we know why it exists. And intention can only be rationalized when everything else to the left is thoughtfully considered. Um, now, uh, when I say thoughtful, thoughtful doesn't necessarily mean that every uh, possible scenario um, is considered. Uh, it, it means that enough has been considered to successfully to be successfully accountable or confident in any risk presented by the stated intent. Uh, 
so two areas, these are two areas essentially where information architecture uh, as an area of study can provide value to teams that are, uh, that are trying to design uh, digital products. And uh, where these ideas or the information architecture lens uh, fits very well is in the area of the strategy side uh, that is working with intent that I discussed. And uh, the others realized as structure and, um, and so what I'm gonna do is uh, take an opportunity to dig into uh, structure a little bit um, in scale, because this is something that an area where uh, I can speak to even more just to give you an idea of um, what we might mean when we, when we say structure. Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the things that this field has not been able to do or has not done enough is to really talk about structure and understand and, and to be able to express what we mean by it. Um, however, because we have uh, these, uh, I hope you can see my mouse too, uh, because we have uh, this uh, level right down here, context, language, behavior, content, topology, constraints, and intent. These are all things that um, we that run deeper and we can begin to model. But before I show you that, let me um, show you um, how going deep in that area um, uh, actually plays out in an organization. Um, and I've done this um, at, um, at one previous uh, employer uh, in, in the environment where I was a director of information architecture. Um, this is IA thinking um, or thinking about applying information architecture uh, uh, for uh, a, the structure at a system uh, level and at scale. So working in enterprise teams uh, over the last 15 years, um, I developed an approach for working with teams that um, were typically of the agile or lean mindset, um, and also as well as uh, waterfall uh, and everything in between. Um, many of these teams are comfortable in producing interfaces uh, with greater frequency and, and moving fast. And so when that happens, a lot of documentation gets produced and teams, and even today, teams are producing a lot of documentation. Uh, and a lot of this documentation has a lot of conceptual uh, insights into it. A lot of conceptual assertions and assumptions and models um, uh, playing out. The problem is these teams uh, typically don't effectively document these conceptual assertions. Uh, it's all over the place and it's sporadic. Um, and so these, the, the conceptual assumptions never um, get formally managed, right? Um, similar to uh, an important aspect of conceptual integrity that um, uh, Jorge Herrero mentioned. Uh, now, most teams don't hire information architecture practitioners uh, to do this work. And, um, Really, this is one of the areas where information architecture thinking provides tremendous value uh, for organizations. Um, most teams don't understand where to start. Um, so uh, what, I'll, what I'll do here is uh, uh, walk really quickly uh, around this model. Um, so the idea here, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is that tremendous amount of documentation. So if you work in, or think about organizations that you're in today, and uh, you may have des uh, design teams that are uh, using the heck out of M Miro and, and Miro, and these, the, that software, uh, uh, you know, promotes the rampant use of canvases and model making um, and, and documentation. However, uh, it's spread across 
many, many teams and it's never really um, uh, captured and there's no one really um, centralizing that work because the idea, these models, teams are using these models that they're creating, these conceptual models, whatever they need in order to uh, express their vision and express how something needs to work. They're doing it to get to the design, to the solution, and then to get something out the door. So it's an afterthought to maintain that. And so what, what um, I have expertise in is inserting you know, workflows around and cadence around um, uh, 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 cre uh, creating a centralized modeling discipline uh, in uh, diagnosing um, uh, what that uh, structure looks like. And that's the thing, you can't really diagnose a structure until you begin to put all the pieces together. And, uh, and so the first thing is doing this inventory of, uh, of all of the, of the documentation and slowly over time, and it takes a long time it, to uh, begin connecting all of these uh, um, conceptual models because there is a connection. If you're in a company uh, and your company has multiple products, typically those products uh, crisscross and services crisscross or uh, the operational side of the business is, is, is connected in some way, their relationships. And so by having a practice of modeling all of these different relationships, whether it's um, users uh, or if it's business, if it's um, uh, uh, content, um, you eventually build a much richer perspective of what's really happening under the hood from a conceptual level. Uh, additionally, when you're doing that, it allows you to um, inform, better inform the team uh, about things that uh, they're trying to do from a design perspective, because now the team teams can have a, a, a broader connected or systemic view of the interfaces that they're trying to create. Um, and, um, and so, so remember where we had uh, content, context, language, behavior, content, right? Interaction, topology constraints, all of these is, this is where um, teams can actually start digging deeper to uh, bring in the documentation around these things to start modeling and to start doing it in a more formal way uh, and uh, with a cadence and a practice of maintaining it and growing it and consuming new uh, uh, conceptual models as the teams uh, uh, build those out. And the idea is that uh, you want to have in your organization, a large organization typically, um, uh, a human-centered approach or human-centered models. Um, and that's important because that's typically uh, the major gap that rests uh, in technology organizations. Uh, they have a data architecture that is dependent on physical models, logical models, and conceptual models. Where the huge gap is in technology teams is their ability to derive and uh, produce and, and maintain conceptual models. Their conceptual models are typically business-focused models, uh, marketing and sales uh, models, but there is a huge lack of uh, uh, of insight and input into their data, data architectures uh, that are human-centered. And that's where design teams can um, build out greater uh, um, sophistication and maturity by beginning to explore practices of, uh, of in the hard work of modeling all of uh, the, the aspects that drive a user interface. Um, there's a huge benefit uh, as well because what this allows the technology team to do is to um, uh, build out richer um, uh, and uh, deeper fidelity uh, around their concepts to even drive their existing knowledge systems um, and uh, connecting into future uh, uh, initiatives around machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, and um, uh, training mo models uh, 
uh, for those, those uh, platforms. So information architecture, to, to close this out, um, it's, uh, it's an area of study uh, that, uh, that's good for design teams or any organization taking on complex problems. And for more than two decades, practitioners have advocated beginning any project with uh, an IA lens. Um, I wanna be clear that the definition uh, I presented here is an expression for information architecture as an area of study. It's not meant to express uh, a practice of information architecture. Um, it's actually bigger than that. It is meant to represent the head of the taxonomy that any practice or discipline or science or theory, et cetera, uh, would fall under. Um, and, and that's also another conversation. Uh, but uh, I hope all of this, uh, you found this interesting and useful and uh, thank you.